Okay, I think we'll get started. Hi, uh, my name is Tian Shaw. I'm a product marketing manager at Samsung for SSDs. Uh, by a show of hands, who knows what an SSD is? <laughs> okay, good crowd. Uh, how many own an SSD at home? Hmm. How many have a Samsung SSD at home? <laughs> good crowd. Well, at the end of this presentation, I'll be giving away two uh, 500 gig SSDs, USB 3.0. I'll uh, ask a couple of random questions from my presentation. So, uh, pretty good odds today. <laughs> Two SSDs to give away. So, stick around. So, first of all, I want to thank everyone for taking the time out this afternoon to be with us. I know that everyone's time is very valuable. And time actually is becoming more valuable over time. And that's an interesting concept, and I'll go into a little bit of what I mean by that. Ever since the invention of the integrated circuit five decades ago, um, we've experienced a phenomenon known as Moore's Law, where basically the number of transistors doubles every couple of years, right? So basically, um, if you think about how much impact that's had on us as a society, right? Uh, what we have today. Um, it's kind of hard to imagine what it's like because the uh, exponential growth has been inside something so small as an IC. You can't really see what's happening. So I'm going to use an analogy to kind of illustrate the type of growth that we've been seeing in computing power. So. I'm from San, San Jose, so I went to a football game this last weekend. We actually uh, won a game, the 49ers. <laughs> so I'm going to use the uh, football field in, in my analogy. So it's been 57 years since the invention of the IC. So if we have exponential growth every couple of years, you divide 57 by 2, that's 28 and a half steps we've had in, in terms of the IC. So if you took 28 and a half linear physical steps, you would have walked a little over the quarter of a you know, length of the football field. However, if you took 28 and a half exponential steps, you would have traveled all the way to the moon. So this gives you an idea of the profound changes that have happened inside a computer. Incidentally, the uh, iPhones that you have in your pocket today are about 120 million times faster than the computer that guided Apollo 11 to the moon, the first man on the moon. And you have 120 million times that power inside your pocket today. So to continue along this uh, you know, space theme, if you will, uh, the geocentric model of our universe, where we thought the Earth was the center of the universe, dates back to the 6th century BC. It wasn't until the 16th century that our knowledge of the universe had evolved to a point where now we have what we call heliocentric model, the sun being the center of our solar system. So without the aid of computers, so pre-computing era, it took over 2,000 years for our understanding to evolve to a heliocentric model. The reason I go into this is uh, we have an analogy that's going on in the PC universe today. So the PC was kind of seen as the center of our computing universe. This is where data and information was stored. You know, new technologies, peripherals came along that complemented the PC, but data was always stored centrally in the PC, and it was set, seen as the center of information. However, if you redraw this tech universe in a different way, you'll see that they all have something in common, and that's the cloud. Today, uh, basically everything is being shared via the cloud as the central store. And this has some advantages, right? So basically, with the cloud as a central store of information, basically you can create data in one or more devices, and you can see that data in one, more, in one or more devices. So this idea of sharing and generating data at different points and everywhere 
basically has a lot of advantages. So with the aid of the computing era, it took just 20 years for us to evolve to a cloud-centric model in the computing universe. And all these devices are leading to a massive growth and amount of data that's out there. We used to only have one PC per household, right? So basically, you know, applications cost money, probably required special skills. Um, computer was on, not on most of the time. Most people probably, you know, had it off until they come home, right, at the end of work to use it. However, times have changed a lot, right? We've now got multiple devices per user in the household. And these de devices are generating data all the time. So basically, uh, we generate over 40 exabytes of data every month last year. And it's growing exponentially. To give some context, one exabyte of data is 3,000 times the amount stored in the entire Library of Congress. So we're talking about 40 exabytes every month. And that was last year. So television is also generating uh, and contributing to this massive data growth. I remember when 27-inch CRT screens were considered large screen TVs. <laughs> Back then, standard definition seemed adequate, right? So now with much larger screens, right, with LCD, pushing 55 inch being kind of like the entry model now, right? $500 and below price points. Uh, we all know that 480p is not gonna cut it. So it's driven the need for 720, 1080p high definition. But, as screen sizes uh, get even larger, people are starting to put 70, 80 inch TVs now in their home. With larger screens, even 1080p, you're starting to see the pixelization and granularity. So that's the push toward 4K video. All this is contributing to massive growth in data. So uh, with this insatiable demand that consumers have for data and access to data, uh, we need speeds that keep up. So if you look at mobile, your mobile device, 3G going to 4G, which basically can support 100 megabit per second. Before the end of this decade, uh, we'll be introducing 5G on mobile phones. 5G will get you to 10 gigabits per second. That's on a mobile device. It's pretty amazing if you think about it. For the notebook, in terms of wireless speeds. We basically have, you know, 802.11n and 802.11ac, which pushes over a gigabit per second. With the new platforms coming out, uh, basically Intel Skylake, right, the new PC platform, they've introduced 802.11ad, which is Y gig, which gives you seven gigabit per second speeds. How about on the wired side? If you look at wired speeds, USB 2.0, 480 megabits per second. USB 3.0 at five gigs with Skylake platforms, the new PCs, introducing USB 3.1 at 10 gig and Thunderbolt 3 at 40 gig. Amazing speeds, these are client devices. So, with all these uh, new networking speeds, um, how is storage keeping up? Well, if you look at basically what's offered in um, laptops of yesterday, most of you probably have laptops that have a hard disk drive, probably has wireless and USB 2.0. The hard disk drive kept up with these speeds okay. Sometimes if you're not on wireless, you probably connect to gigabit ethernet which is, you know, 125 megabytes per second. So the hard disk drive wasn't the bottleneck in the system. It could keep up with the networking speeds of the day. However, if you look at the new PC platforms, Skylake, all the speeds being offered on networking are much, much faster 
than what the hard disk drive can achieve. So this is the first time in history that the local storage will be slower than the networking speeds. The first time in history that getting data in and out of your PC will be uh, basically bottlenecked by the local storage. So it actually makes no sense to de design a new PC with all these networking speeds and then put in a hard disk drive. It just doesn't make any sense. So SSDs, solid state drives, can alleviate this problem. A SATA SSD has typical speeds of 550 megabytes per second, so about five times faster than the HDD. However, if you take a look at you know, some of the uh, fast speeds offered by networking, even a SATA SSD may not keep up with some of the newer technologies. So it's time for an interface and protocol designed for fast storage. So SATA was designed with slower storage medium in mind, spinning platters, hard disk drives. NVMe, which stands for Non-Volatile Memory Express, is a protocol designed specifically for faster flash memory. This unleashes basically the power of flash. So NVMe is a protocol that rides on PCIe, and currently we're on PCIe Gen 3, which supports 8 gigabit per second per lane. So an NVMe SSD that has four lanes, four times eight, supports up to 32 gigabit per second on the host interface, which means the, hard di the uh, SSD can support 4,000 megabytes per second. So NVMe SSDs really is uh, the only viable option for the PCs of today and tomorrow. However, throughput is not really the only difference between SATA and NVMe. If you look at uh, SATA in terms of um, the number of queues and commands per queue, one compared to 64,000 queues. Number of commands per queue, 32 compared to 64,000 commands per queue. Basically, NVMe was designed, like I said, with the fast storage in mind behind it, right? So there's much more parallelism built in. So I'm going to use an analogy um, again. Uh, a lot of you probably flew into Austin today, uh, went through the airport, probably went through TSA screening. Um, imagine that there was only one line, one x-ray machine where you had to scan all your carry-on luggage. I think a lot of you would be probably pretty upset with the lines. <laughs> That's what you're getting with SATA, one single queue. Compare that with NVMe, it's like basically having multiple lines, multiple, multiple machines to scan your luggage to get in. So the parallelism uh, basically leads to much, much faster interface, lower latencies. So the impact on the PC. So I'm going to take a couple examples here to illustrate uh, the benefits right, of NVMe to the user. So imagine you went to a fantastic tech conference, gained lots of good insights, lots of great material, PowerPoint presentations, and files you want to take home and share with your colleagues, uh, 10 gigabytes worth on the PC of Yesterday, right, using a hard disk drive, USB stick dongle, it would take you three minutes to put the stuff on the USB stick and three minutes to download it onto a college PC. So about six minutes to transfer 10 gigabytes worth of files. However, with an NVMe SSD, with some of the newer technologies like Thunderbolt, this will take you 10 seconds. Becomes very painless in terms of doing tasks like this, right? NVMe saves you time. And like I mentioned earlier, time is becoming ever more valuable. So uh, time is not the only thing that you gain, though, by having faster speeds. 
Faster speeds means uh, completing tasks quicker. And this is actually very important when it comes to uh, mobile devices because the active power and the idle power of a storage device is drastically different. So if you look at the previous example of transferring 10 gigabytes worth of uh, files, right, for the HDD, it takes about you know, 180 seconds, right, three minutes from the notebook onto the USB stick. During that time, it's going to be at the active power, about six watts. You compare that to the SSD that can complete the task in 10 seconds, right? So it'll be at roughly six watts for 10 seconds. Then the remaining time, it's going to be on idle power, which is in the realm of 50 milliwatts. So what this translates to is 94% less power used by the SSD device. Extend your battery life. OK, how about the data center? So what I have here is a, a very um, popular, dense, rack form factor uh, server that's used in data centers and, and storage device. So a 1U uh, form factor can support up to 10 2 and a half inch drives, just due to, if you take a look, the, the physical limitation, right? If you put 10 SATA SSDs in there, you can support up to 40 gigabit per second throughput. However, if you used an NVMe SSD, you can do it one. One SSD can deliver that 40 gigabit per second of throughput. Think of the savings in terms of form factor, power. Basically, all these things can be passed down to the end user in terms of the benefit. Let's uh, take a look at another example, something a lot of us do, which is watch TV. So I alluded earlier to you know, the uh, resolutions, right, getting higher. But a lot of us as consumers don't really understand what it takes uh, and how service providers price their products. So let's take a look. Uh, the 1080p actually requires 6 megabit per second of data throughput to support a high definition uh, stream. Now, if we want to support ultra high definition or 4K, it takes 20 megabits per second or more than three times the bandwidth of high definition. So why is this significant? Well, if you take a look at the 10, uh, as, uh, the 10 SSDs that we're talking about in a 1U server, right, that support 40 gigabit per second of throughput. Uh, the rough math in terms of number of subscribers you can support is you divide the 40 gigabit per second by the 6 megabit per second, right, per stream. Gives you roughly between six and 7,000 subscribers that you can support simultaneously on high definition. Now, as uh, screens get larger and users want better uh, quality, right, they're demanding now that you support 4K. So what can you do? Well, you could uh, use three of these 1U servers fully equipped with the 10 SATA SSDs, meaning that you have 30 right, SATA SSDs in order to support the same number of subscribers. But what happens to your subscription fees then? I mean, they have to pass the cost along to the user. So it leads to an unacceptable rise in your subscription rates. But alternatively, you can just support the same number of subscribers now on 4K with three of these NVMe SSDs. Leads uh, you know, the service provider to provide much more competitive service offerings. So with all of these uh, devices generating all this data, all this information, algorithms are going to need fast access to data, right, and fast analysis to make decisions in real time. Think of applications like, you know, the self-driving car, right? The self-driving car where split-second decisions could mean the difference between life and death or ser serious accident. Think of uh, surgical procedures. People are talking about you know, doing surgeries remotely, right, where 
you're operating on somebody, you don't want any sort of latency involved when you're doing open heart surgery. Think of uh, sock trading. How many of you have read the book Flash Boys, Michael Lewis? <laughs> Some of you. <laughs> yeah, in, in there, basically, he talks about how uh, these uh, stock trading firms, high frequency trading firms, are spending hundreds of millions of dollars on infrastructure upgrades just to gain a millisecond advantage over the competition. That millisecond is worth a lot of money. Time is money, and people are, need uh, the advantage anywhere they can get it. We also have uh, an application where uh, one of the world's largest financial processing uh, houses is using Samsung MME along with Dell PowerEdge servers to basically uh, do real-time fraud prevention. So if uh, those of you who are interested, feel free to come to our booth where we have more information on that application. So to circle back, I mentioned you know, it took about 2,000 years for our understanding to evolve to kind of the sun being the center of our solar system. It took about 20 years in our computing universe to evolve where the cloud is the center, right? I believe it's going to take maybe just two years for NVMe to displace hard drives and PCs. It's about saving time. NVMe saves you time, and it's about time HDDs are laid to rest. OK, I'm going to segue into now the technology behind uh, NVMe SSDs, the NAND, right? So what's powering, what's the ultra-fast storage behind the interface that's powering these capabilities? Samsung has something called TLC VNAND. And by the end of this presentation, all of you should know what that is. As an industry, uh, we've been able to lower costs by going down in process geometry, similar to the, uh, the CPU. However, We've reached the point where uh, you know, we're in the 10, 10x nanometer uh, size in terms of geometry, where the physics are actually getting in the way now. The cells are actually so close together, they're interfering with each other. And this inner cell interference is contributing to actually less reliable memory. This is a situation we want to avoid. So we kind of reached the point where uh, our ability to scale is hampered because the, the capex is increasing and we're getting diminishing returns. So a new dis disruptive technology is required here. An orthogonal approach to process geometry shrinks is to basically contain or hold more bits of data per memory cell. So the industry started with what was called SLC, which stands for single level cell, which means you can so store one bit of data per memory cell. Then the industry went to something called ML MLC, which stands for multi-level cell. Uh, now you can store two bits of information per memory cell. And then Samsung introduced TLC, which stands for tri-level cell, and as you guessed it, three bits of information per memory cell. So this way of increasing density uh, allows us to reduce costs as well. However, if you look at the chart right on the, on the right here, um, going from 1-bit to 2-bit to 3-bit requires distinguishing between more and more voltage levels. Right? So this increasing granularity makes the memory more sensitive to any sort of per perturbation and degradation which basically decreases the NAND reliability as well. So how do we solve this problem? This is where Samsung introduced innovation in the form of 3D NAND. 3D NAND, instead of squeezing cells closer together to, to try to basically uh, increase density uh, via geography, uh, ge um, via the uh, geometry, we stack uh, the cells vertically. On, each, uh, on top of each other. And basically, with uh, 3D NAND, we're now 
able to get similar densities uh, with our second generation to planar NAND. If you took a, took a look at planar NAND, 128 gigabit per die densities we were able to achieve with our uh, first generation and second generation vertical NAND, which we call VNAND. At the Flash Memory Summit a couple of months ago, we introduced our third generation vertical NAND. Now we're getting 256 gigabit per die density. And this is exciting because this is a technology that allows us to scale going forward. It'll take us to one terabit densities and beyond. So how does this translate to performance and alleviating the problems I talked about earlier? If you look at uh, the way uh, performance is measured for NAND, right? NAND basically um, writes in pages, erases in blocks. So these are two key parameters that we would look at to determine the performance of the underlying NAND. So if you look at planar MLC, when we went to TLC with planar NAND, you can see that the page program times increased. So this leads to a decrease in performance of the technology. With VNAND, though, you can see that we gain all of that degradation back and then some. It's actually 67% faster than the planar counterpart, MLC. So this is a TLC 3D NAND faster than planar MLC. Similar with the block erase times. You can see the VNAND TLC outperforms the planar MLC. In endurance, uh, another thing I uh, basically talked about earlier, how going to TLC basically uh, generally reduced the reliability of the NAND just because of the different voltage levels and the granularity that you have to uh, be concerned about. You can see that it was the case with planar NAND going from MLC to planar TLC that we had a 75% loss in terms of the program erase cycles. So the reliability did go down about 75%. But with 3D TLC, you see that we gain all of that back. So there was some uh, hesitation in the enterprise businesses before of going to TLC because of the degradation in reliability. But VNAND gains all of that back. So we're now seeing TLC VNAND being used in a lot of enterprise applications across all of our drives. So to show uh, the NAND being used in SSDs, how does this translate to actual SSD performance? If you take a look at the sequential read and writes, I compared basically the uh, planar MLC-based SSD to a VNAND TLC-based SSD. So you can see both for sequential reads and writes, the VNAND TLC SSD performed better. How about data center class drives? Data center, you're concerned not just with the sequential read and write, but also the random performance. You can see in both cases, the VNAND TLC drive performs better than the MLC counterpart. So as testament to this uh, technology, uh, at Flash Mem Memory Summit, we introduced uh, basically the world's fastest drive using TLC VNAND. One million IOPS in a single drive. <laughs> it's up to 6,000 megabytes per second sequential performance, up to 6.4 terabyte capacity. So TLC VNAND enables many world firsts. This is one of them. We also introduced the world's highest capacity drive. It's not just SSD capacity, it's just capacity in general. We surpassed that what's available on hard disk drives. So TLC VNAND enables us to scale in terms of density. So 16 terabytes in a single drive, what does that mean? 8,000 high def movies can be contained in a single drive. It also enabled us to offer the world's lowest power NVMe data center drive. So NVMe, because it's very high performance, um, 
a lot of the products offered generally was, you know, taking up most of the power that the slot could offer, about 25 watts to drive the performance. Uh, we have now, using TLC VNAND, a drive that's under 8 watts NVMe. So this puts it in the same power envelope as, as SATA SSDs. So you're talking about much, much better performance drawing about the same power as SATA SSDs. So where are these drives being used? They're, they're offered everywhere right now. So if you look at the client uh, drives, the Dell Latitudes, the commercial laptops, the Dell XPS, the consumer laptops, uh, different form factors, two and a half inch, as well as the M.2. For those of you who aren't familiar, M.2, very small, very thin, light, enables the thin and light designs that you see in PCs today. Something that hard disk drives can't enable in terms of the form factor. How about the data center? Well, three months ago, Dell announced uh, basically the use of Samsung's TLC um, VNAND drives in the compellent arrays, enabling them to hit a price point of $1.66 per gigabyte. $1.66 per gigabyte, if you think about it, is about the same price range as 15K hard drives. So now you have much, much better performance uh, much better reliability at around the same price point as hard disk drives. So we see this driving an infl inflection in the marketplace in terms of adoption in the data center because it becomes a no-brainer now. So TLC VNAN, it gives you the scalability, gives you the performance. It's the enabler of many of the world first, right? World's fastest drive, the world's highest capacity drive, and the world's lowest power NVMe drive. And it's everywhere. It's available today. We've shipped over 5 million TLC VNAND drives in the market already. So if you're interested, feel free to uh, you know, come to our booth, take a look. Now I'll pass it on to our partner, Dell, who will talk a little bit more about NVMe applications and their servers. Are you swap? I'll let the uh, AV guys swap the slides. I'll introduce myself. I'm Robert Hormuth. I'm in the uh, Enterprise uh, CTO office. I uh, head up our platform architecture and technology group. So we have a, a group that's responsible for server storage, networking software, kind of solutions architecture, working out in time. And uh, so I'm happy to be here today. And thanks for, for Samsung for inviting me to, to speak. I just want to just have a couple slides. and. Uh, to talk about NVMe and kind of what we've done with it at Dell. In fact, I had a, qu I had a couple questions here I need to make sure I bring up. So you haven't given those away yet. OK. <laughs> so, so I wanted to start with, does anybody know where NVMe, where NVMe originated or came from or how it came to be? Is anybody in the room around back then? So. You know, five, six years ago, I, I can tell the story because I was, I was part of it. So about five, six years ago at Dell, when everybody in the industry, it seemed like, was making a PCIe flash card. I mean, there, there was probably 12 guys at a time. And they were all doing different proprietary solutions, different drivers, and, you know, it was, a, it was chaos. And so, you know, what we heard from customers was, hey, I really like this. IOPS gain of, of putting storage on PCIe, it solves some of the IOPS to uh, CPU performance gap, but I can't stand having five different drivers. I, I need in-the-box OS, I need some commonality, I need, you know, I'm used to hard drives looking and filling and quacking like a duck and being a duck, and they couldn't get that. And so we got together with some of our partners back then um, that started to take the, uh, the NVMe, there was a, a client version of an M NVMe spec. And so we went and worked with Intel and some of our partners like Samsung and said, hey, we've got this client version of this thing, but let's go enterprise it. So we need to add a lot of queues and a lot of parallelism because we're dealing with all these multi-core CPUs. So we started that. And we also started a form factor standardization group um, to standardize 
that connector so it looks like a drive, acts like a drive, hot plugs like a drive. So that started back about five, about five years ago is when that started. And the reason we did that was because we wanted to drive to get through to you know to get through that innovation dilemma of getting enough adoption, we needed to standardize on it. So anyway, that was the, the quick story behind it. Um, and what the reason that we came up with NVMe was we looked at SCSI back in the day, and there were some of our competitors that wanted to do, hey, let's just keep extending SCSI, let's just keep putting a Band-Aid on SCSI and run SCSI over PCIe, and we didn't feel that was right. Um, because it was not, it was optimized, SCSI at the time was optimized for rotating disk. It was written for rotating disk. Does anybody know, so can I give a question to see who, does anybody know how long or where SCSI came from? And Bill Dawkins, you can't answer. No? Yeah, actually it started, do you know what, about a year? That's pretty close. Yeah, so, so the story, and that's why I had to write this down, because I'm old in the computer industry, but I'm not as old as I could be, maybe. So in 1979, uh, Shugart Associate Systems Interface was the guy that kind of took the floppy interface and made the, uh, the, the disk interface. And so back in 81, they took what was called SASE and worked with NCR, and they took it to ANSI, and that's what turned into the SCSI interface. So it's basically a 35, 36-year-old interface is when SCSI was invented. Um, it's a, you know, not a very modern interface when you go from something like that and you go to something like this in the middle where, you know, lots of chips, lots of parallelism, right? Because you're, you're not, I don't have one head, one cylinder, one disc. So a lot of parallelism is possible here. And, you know, and, and, and has no rotational latency and it thrives on random access. And so we concluded that trying to band-aid SCSI was a bad idea. So that's why we did the NVMe pr new protocol so that we could actually take advantage of it. So it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like multi-core CPUs. You know, the NVMe is very multi-queue oriented, so it, it lines up very nicely with multi-core CPUs and a, a multi-queue um, kind of thing. And so the pictures are kind of, if you think about a robot, you know, back in the old day, can do one thing at a time versus today, you've got a multi-armed robot. Um, yeah, we could have made the conveyor belts go faster here, but just still one arm, one head. And so we had to modernize the interface. That's why we did NVMe to, to, to take advantage of the new flash technologies like Samsung is, is creating so that we could create an interface that is optimized at the storage stack. So not only is NVMe fast on PCIe and fast flash, but the storage stack is optimized for it. So we don't have this heavy OS um, storage stack in the way. So it's been optimized for, uh, for the technology. And so what we've done at Dell, um, we started this journey back in 2010. We came out with some of the first PCIe Express, NV, what we called back then was NVM Express drives, so kind of pre-spec compliant drives. So in our 12th generation, we kind of had pre-spec compliant drives that were front load, accessible, had the new connector, um, but the ecosystem wasn't fully there. And we recently, you know, now we have drives like working with Samsung, so we have Samsung um, drives that are actually NVMe compliant all the way up to 3.2 terabytes. Um, offered in Dell systems that are actually truly NVMe compliant. They're not just the pre-spec. Um, and so we started introducing that in 12G. At 13G, we continue to enhance our portfolio. So today we have servers from the 730 all the way to the 930, um, anywhere from a two socket to a high-end four socket. You can get anywhere from two to four to eight NVMe front accessible drives that have hot plug, um, continue to enhance the capabilities, um, you know, and by having the NVMe abstraction in there, it allows the drive vendors and the flash vendors like Samsung to innovate at their own pace because we have a standard NVMe driver that OS is used, and so the drive manufacturers have freedom to innovate behind it. So they can do their own controller, they can do their own ECC or whatever algorithms they want to do behind the interface, they have full freedom to do that. Um, without having to put a burden on the OS or an IT chain so that the IT level, you don't have to, you get the freedom, to, they can have the freedom to innovate as fast as they want because of this abstracted interface, which is 
what's been enabling Samsung to go really fast with capacities and performance. Um, and again, the, you know, one of the things that with NVMe, you know, the, the, the drives can do the flash-based management behind the controller. Um, I'll, I'll bet my, I'll, I'll say on my career, um, they're probably better at managing their flash than I could as a firmware engineer because they know their process, they know their technology. So let the, let the drive guys, the flash vendors manage the flash. We'll provide the interface too and the system side. Um, and so there's a wide range of applications that are really good for flash drives. And Tien's highlighted a lot of the benefits of performance, latency, power. Um, but, you know, things like online, OLTP, OLAP, collaborative environments, virtualization, all enhance the capabilities. And to me, it's almost, if you think about, you're deploying multi-core CPUs today. Think about buying a Ferrari and putting some really low-speed bicycle tires on the Ferrari. You'd never do that, right? Ferrari won't let you buy a car with low-speed rated tires. I mean, to me, buying a, a high-end multi-core CPU kind of complex with a lot of memory and virtualization without a storage subsystem that supports it is, you know, kind of like buying a car with bad tires. Um, so we continue to, to enhance our portfolio and add more management capabilities into our, uh, our devices. So our iDRAC and OMSA and our lifecycle controller now start to natively manage some of the NVMe attributes. And so, let me go on the wrong way. So some of the things we've done, so this is a case study that we just published um, with Samsung. I think it was done by Principal Technologies. Uh, this was an Oracle database example where we basically compared, you know, a four, this is our new four socket R930, and it has up to eight NVMe drives, so you can get four here and four here. Um, and so we compared that to, you know, just 22 SAS drives, all the way up to running the database, um, so putting the Oracle on eight NV Samsung NVMe drives. And so, you know, just by replacing the drives, we didn't change any application, any software, just going from all SAS drives, um, SAS rotating to, um, you know, um, NVMe, uh, Samsung NVMe SSEs, you know, it's almost 14x performance gain. That's a normally, that's a software engineer's nirvana, right? Don't change any code, rip out the hardware underneath, and it just goes faster. That's what a lot of our, and that's good for, for your end users, for the, the guys at the end of your website that are trying to do transactions. They don't get bored on the page, they buy more. You can, re, you can render the page faster. You could do a lot of things because of that speed up. Um, so there's a lot of reasons, you know, I think we've talked about on, on why to go do NVMe. I also wanted to touch on just kind of where we're going with it and why it's, I think it's really important to get on the NVMe bandwagon now because it's a, it's a uh, truck that's a coming and it's taken off. And today, you know, we have NVMe 1.1, 1.0, and that's really the spec is targeted for data center, server, and workstation. Um, there's other versions in development 1.2 and 1.3. 1.2 is targeted for PC and tablets. It's to get the interface, so it's, again, it's that common driver interface so that companies like Samsung can go do an NVMe controller with the right flash behind it for these different markets. There's also a version for 1.3 targeting the smartphones. Smartphones need flash too. They don't like writing custom code. They want to take advantage of NVMe or PCIe to it. But it takes a different spec. So in the in the the 1.3, lower power, more sleep states, um, you know, a much lower, much smaller controller, so you can BGA the controller much smaller. The number of parallel channels needed, and so NVMe is really starting to to propagate, and across the industry. So in 2015 and 2016, some of these are start. You know, will be way beyond the server workstation centric to where clients are starting to adopt. The M.2 kind of version will start to go in your, your notebooks because you can start to make these incredible drives up to 16 terabytes with flash, and so we need the interface for that, and that's where NVMe fits in. Um, there's a management interface coming in Q3 of 15, so again, the standards work, and the collaboration with our partners in the industry to standardize some of this so that you get the full benefit is still ongoing. So this is going to enable some of the pre-boot, out-of-band management capabilities, 
more power budgeting, inventory, health monitoring, standardized firmware updates, things of that nature that all the lessons that we learned in the, the last 30 years about how do you update a drive firmware, how many, how many people have had to update drive firmware five different ways on five different vendors' drives? Is it fun? Or would you like to do it one way on all vendors? That's why we're, so we've learned our lesson in the industry. And we've got a lot of great feedback from you guys that have had those horror stories. And so we're putting those things into the standard to baseline. But again, it doesn't stop the innovation because the innovation can happen at our system side, how we manage them or, or how we allocate. We can still add our own innovation. The drive vendors can innovate behind it on how their controller works and how they manage the flash. So I think it's a very, very complimentary way of handling um, the industry and moving the industry along but still allowing fast innovation. There's things that are coming that we're thinking about next around how to add hints. And one of the other benefits of getting to NVMe and off the old SCSI stack is we can actually start thinking about how do we allow applications and OSs to provide hints to the drives um, or to you know, other attributes of the system so that the storage subsystem can be smarter about quality of service, how to preload, pre-read, different elements, we can start getting smarter by providing hints to the, uh, the drives. And then lastly, um, the other standard that we're working on in the industry, which should be coming out, at least the first pass spec should be out later this year, um, is NVMe over, NVMe over fabrics. So you can still use your NVMe, your, your optimized OS st storage stack that is NVMe oriented, and we're mapping it over different fabrics like NVMe over Ethernet or NVMe over IB um, with RDMA. And so to the end applications, you end up with an optimized client with that optimized NVMe stack. You don't really care how it gets there, but you want to talk to the high-speed drives at the other end. And from a fabric perspective, we want to abstract a way that you shouldn't care if it's Ethernet or... IB or whatever that fabric might be. We want to support whatever fabric that you have in your data center that provides the best benefit and low latency. So we're defining uh, this NVMe protocol over um, various fabrics so that in the future you'll be able to have, instead of having you know, file block and NVMe fabrics, you'll be able to uh, you know, have a, a storage array or something that has NVMe, native NVMe on the back side so that you can take advantage of these super big fast flash drives. So that's kind of where we're going with NVMe in the future. And that was all I had. I don't know, Tian, if you had any a summary slide or anything to wrap up with. Um, so, yeah. Do we have time for yeah, questions? Right. We wanted to leave some time for Q&A, and then we'll ask a couple of questions for the drawing. <laughs> I'm on a Jeff. <laughs> Our current uh, 3.2 is it MLC? Yes. I believe it is. Yes, it is. Okay. On the this, this is where you are now. yeah, this is where we are now, right? And, and we've seen the slides prior to that, that show uh, really good technology coming. You yeah. can imagine that's going to be updated in the future with newer, bigger, faster drives. Yes. No. So when I talked about the Dell announcement, is that what you're referring to? Yes, uh, Dell made an announcement back in July of uh, $1.66 per gigabyte on a system raw flash level um, offered in the compellent system. So I think it was the SC4020 platform that they made the initial announcement with. So that's a price point that's in the same price range as 15K hard drives. So in the past, people have talked about you know, TCO uh, being you know, better for flash. But even taking out the TCO argument, just comparing raw gigabytes, they've hit similar price points to 15K hard drives. Yes? Um, you brought up that they're, they're working toward the management standard. 
mm -hmm. drives. Um, Intel on the consumer platform, Skylake, has announced that you can now raid NVMe outside of the OS, which has been a problem in a lot of the data centers I've worked in. But no matter what, they want to hear the ribby button. Mm -hmm. They want to hear the ribby button. Are right. they working towards an enterprise level raiding of NVMe storage outside of the OS? So there are, you know, so certainly. You know, the, the great thing about, about NVMe and being PCIe is it's kind of, it's an open, innovative, collaborative environment. So could a company be working on a chip that does hardware RAID with NVMe? Certainly. Um, do I expect to see that in the future? Certainly. I, I think there will be. I think one of the problems of the difference between client and server is, you know, show, I mean, we have drives that do a million IOPS. How do you put six of them behind a singular chip and keep up with six million IOPS? So we have to rethink how we do RAID. You know, do we only do RAID, you know, one in ten and not do five, six? And so, you know, have we prototyped trying to do hardware RAID? Absolutely. I wouldn't be, I'd be, you'd probably be remiss if I didn't tell you we were playing with that kind of technology. We're not ready to, uh, the, the, there's still some work to be done to, to try and truly figure out how to do hardware RAID with NVMe, but I do think it there'll be versions of it coming. Um, but with the you know with the world so hot and heavy on software defined, we also have learned the lessons on you know all the SDS providers wanted the RAID controller in bypass mode and get out of the way. So just give me the drive. So the uh, software defined storage, the the current solutions are great for it, um, but we will be looking at hardware. Um, raid in the future. Is that, how important is that? Well, I, I, just, I just know I've come across it a lot of times. I've, I've, the last company, few companies I've worked for, I've been pushing to get, out, get away from hard drives as hard as I can. And uh, in a lot of instances, in, in SATA, it's easy. You, know, you plug them into the exact same slot, they're raided the exact same way. Right. Um, but on the PCIe side, you know, people have complained about high ops and performance. I'm like, well, put a card in there. And yeah. Here it's just a singular card. They're like, yeah. nope. Well, I think that's part of the. Yeah. Well, and I, I think that's the other rationalization we as an industry have to go through, right? The, uh, the old thinking of RAID with rotating disk. I mean, the failure RAID. On, I mean, uh, the failure mechanism of an old rotating disk. Take the head, scratch it across the thing. The whole drive's dead. You know what happens on an SSD is you may lose a couple bits or bytes or a chip, but the rest of the drive can still operate. So do we supply the same thinking that we did the last 35 years, or do we come up with something new and different? So I think that's why you haven't seen any hardware RAID yet on NVMe, because we need to think through the failure mechanisms and the failure characteristics are vastly different than, than they were 30 years ago. So we need to think it through and do something different, because I hate to put the same Band-Aid on, on a 30-year-old problem. So. Do you see arrays starting to adopt NVMe, not so much to allow Uh, tell me more. <laughs> you well, mean smarter can, arrays, or it can make the array smarter so it can, as it's ingesting the data, it can start classifying it so that you can do reporting on it from within the array itself. Yeah, I think we have that today. I mean, take an R seven thirty XD and chunk it full of NVMe's and write the right software, and you can turn it into an ice. You can turn it into a NVMe over fabric smart array that that does those analytics in line. I mean, today we would. I would argue we would do that by taking a server. I mean, the servers become the base computing block of just about everything in IT. So take a server, put a different OS load on it, and call it a, call it a smart array appliance. So I certainly think you can, you can do that. I mean, you could do that today, I mean, with the right software. I mean, you might need some hardware acceleration widgets in there to help on some of the data processing, maybe. But uh, you can get a lot of horsepower in a two-socket Xeon. Um, yeah, let's, t let's talk more offline. I like to understand what, okay, what we'll you'd like to see. Okay, we'll take one last question, then we'll do the drawing. So, one of the things that's limited us from looking at this technology is the limited number of slots in a server. Right now, the most you have in a standard size server is four. Right. Once we've done the, the monster 
So we started, so I'll just go through the progression. So we started with NVMe and Blades that had two. We added servers that had four. We've added servers that have eight now. So, you know, that pretty, that points a trajectory of up. So yeah, I think, I mean, you, you should expect to see more in the future. Yeah, so I think you, and I, I probably didn't hit that, and, and so a point that I want to actually make, I think one of the things to keep in mind with NVMe in the future, it's not going to be just about performance. There will be 16 terabyte drives that have the different kind of flash that aren't going to be a million IOPS, but it's going to be 16 terabytes, and it might be a by 2 PCIe. The great thing about the NVMe and the protocol, we can run it over a by 1 a by 2 a by 4 or by 8 so I think you will see a, a wide range of drives, just like you have different rotational speeds, hard drives today. You're going to see different performance levels of drives at different capacities um, to address that point. So could you have a 24 drive NVMe with super high capacity, but they're still doing, you know, without trying, they're going to do a couple hundred thousand IOPS um, independently. So I think that's an important thing to note is that there will be a range of performance and cap capacities in the future. And I don't know if maybe you want to comment on that. Yeah. with your plans yeah i mean uh with the technology that we're offering right uh both in terms of tlc and vnan's ability to scale we're going to have a pretty complete portfolio across you know sas uh requirements nvme requirements different density requirements different endurance requirements we listen to what you guys want yeah, okay it's a, it's a great dell model listen to the customer <laughs> Same, seems to work. <laughs> okay, we're going to... Thank you. Okay, we're going to do a drawing for two Samsung SSDs, 500 gigabytes. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of random questions. Uh, first question. What's the uh, power rating that we're able to enable for a data center MVME drive using TLC VNAND. <laughs> okay. Seven watts run. Seven watts run, full load. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and uh, next question is, don't yell out the answer, just raise your hand. I'll, I'll check who raised their hand first. <laughs> Why does it not make sense to have a hard drive in your PC for new designs? So you first. Yes. Okay. Easy questions. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome.